Welcome everybody with another episode of our webinars, uh, which is going to be discussing uh, plenty of new topics every week. My name is Barry Kassab and I'm an MCA Market Development, which is Musicians and Consumer Audio for short. Uh, today's topic is a very uh, interesting topic and it's one of my favorites, to be honest. Uh, usually in the trainings when I have a nice, decent crowd in the room, it's one of the topics that I always touch upon and I'd like to ask plenty of those questions that is related to this topic. And, to to and the topic today is gonna to be talking about microphones gain structure. But you know, the, the word gain structure is already sounding too big. We need to break it down into more digestible uh, components if we wanna deal with it this way. Now, the, the most important part that is related to the word gain structure. That means when I say structure, it's like a building structure. There, it's, it, there is a foundation for, for the structure to happen, but then if there is no structure for the building, the building is not, not gonna hold itself together really well. So the reason why we call it gain structure is that this is the foundation of every simple uh, or every, uh, every uh, uh, stage in your audio chain. So every every added component in your audio chain is gonna is gonna it's gonna manipulate that gain structure. But let's go to a very basics of it. It's like what uh, what is it and and what does it mean? How does it impact the volume? Why people keep mixing up between gain level volume, or it all sounds the same? Or some people think it's a a technical name for a volume or so. So before we talk about all these details, we're gonna talk about a syndrome as well. That is the first impact of wrong gain structure in addition to other factors. So today we're gonna start talking about feedback. So why are we gonna talk about feedback when we're gonna talk about gain structure? Because this is one of the first reasons why it would impact your, your, your audio chain. And the reason why it does that is that there are many factors that we're gonna talk about right now, but the most important part of it is gain. Now, to kind of talk about feedback, a lot of people know the word feedback is like a microphone feedback, or you know, turn down your mic because it's feeding back, or why your microphone is, is causing feedback, or this band played yesterday with a lot of feedback. So the simple word that defines the syndrome of having a feedback is that, you know, ping sound that is associated with the microphone, like the beep starts quiet and starts to increase. But then, is that normal? Should we just take it as it is? I know a lot of the movies, they put it in, associated with the mic drop. So when somebody would drop some mic, that sound happens. But is that normal? A lot of people live with it normally. It's like, yeah, it's, it's a microphone, it should feedback. But is that normal? No. I know a lot of places where if the team causes by any means, or the whole, let's say, production company by any means, if a feedback happens during the gig, means no pay, or fire that sound engineer. So feedback is something that can be avoided. And I'm quite sure that you went on many gigs, big shows, and the sound from the start until the end was crystal clear, not even a single ping of feedback during the show. But the reason why is that there are plenty of things that have been taken care of from the beginning. And one of the most important parts of them were gain structure as well. Now, to define feedback, first of all, feedback is an oscillation. And in simple words, for an oscillation to happen, the, the gain should be equal to the loss. Now, what does that mean in, in simple words? Let's put it 
in a day-to-day -day example. You have your little bro brother or your daughter or your, or your son on a swing. And usually on a swing, initially you start pushing the swing for the swing to gain momentum, right? So you're putting in, you're pumping in some energy. So you push it at the beginning. And then you keep pushing until you get to the level where you're happy and safe, of course, for your kid. So now to keep the swing going back and forth at the same level all the time without going extra or less, what do you do? You stand there and probably you'll be talking to your son and doing a lot of, you know, the childish talk with them and you know the toying with them. And then the moment it gets to your fingertips, all you need to do is doing a push. Another time it comes back, another push. Are you pushing more? No. Are you pushing less? Less than you first started with, but for the whole period, probably of 15, 20 minutes, depends on how long your kid wants to stay on the, on the swing, you're pushing just a amount, just the same amount to keep the swing going. Now, this is exactly what we talk about when it's a gain equals to the loss. So the loss in the, in the period where the swing or the, in the travel where the swing is going up further away from you and back to you, there's a loss. What you do is just a small push to compensate for the losses in which the swing keeps going the same travel all over the time that you wanted to stay. This is exactly the same syndrome and feedback. So the difference here is that the mic is actually picking up the momentum from the main speaker. So as you can see on, this, on, this, on the screen, when the mic is picking up the sound from the same speaker, and then mic is connected to the same mixer and amplifier that is driving the speaker. So what happens, you have a loop here exactly the same way that a swing creates a loop, which you push and comes back to you to push it again. So what happens is that the mic is picking up a bit of sound from the speaker, goes into the system, the system amplifies it, put it back to the speaker, and the speaker throws that out again, in which the mic picks it up. Now, the, if the gain is more than the loss, that ping sound starts small, and increases until it gets to a level that the speaker is no longer able to throw more than that, which is the maximum output of the speaker. In many cases, if the speaker is maxed out, you're reaching the maximum of, of the amplifier or the maximum SPL that the microphone can handle if it's a condenser microphone. But in either cases, you reach to a saturation level where the system is no longer able to accommodate more level then that ping or that oscillation or that tone is static. It's maxed out. It can be distorted most of the time if, if it wasn't stopped. Most of the times it leads to either breaking drivers or amplifiers. These are the two weakest links in the chain because these are the, 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 the ones that are driven by a high amount of power. And what dictates the frequency of that oscillation is the distance between the mic and the speaker because the sound needs to travel to the microphone. So that distance to travel to the microphone then dictates the oscillation tone. Adding to this, the ambience itself can also contribute in that, which is something we're going to talk about in a bit. Now, there is a terminology here, which is called gain before feedback. And this is something also we're gonna to discuss today. So what does gain before feedback mean? A lot of the engineers talk about a microphone when they compare it to another microphone. It's like, you know, this microphone gives me more gain before feedback, while this one is not. This one tends to feedback way earlier than this microphone. So. That is a terminology we need to understand. So what is gain before feedback? Also, what is the major factors that affect the feedback to happen? Now we understand that feedback happens. We know what it sounds like, but is it the wattage of the amplifier as in the power or the capability of the amplifier? 
or in the street language, how loud the amplifier is? Is it a component to component distance? Is it a, how much equalization means how you filter the microphone? Or is it the type of microphone? Now, don't get me wrong. All of those do contribute to some extent. But if I ask you the questions, which one of those is the most important aspect that dictates feedback? In many presentations or in many trainings, I always hear different arguments from people. Out of 10, most of them would answer the wattage of the amplifier or the equalization. Maybe out of 10, two or three would say a component to component distance. But the answer to this would be in simple words. Distance, 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 and directivity. So the most important part that a lot of the bands fall for, especially when they are still in the early stages of starting to play on stages, is that they don't understand the, the, the number one, directivity of the speakers, directivity of microphones, and the ideal placement for speakers, especially if they are the people to rig these speakers. So in many places, you go in a venue, there's nothing there. You ask the uh, venue managers, like, where's the gear? They tell you it's in a storeroom. You can access it at this time. You go to the storeroom and you start pulling out the speakers, the amplifier, the mixer, maybe a lot of the microphones, and you start rigging them up. Now, a lot of the bands, they make a mistake. They place the speakers on stage next to them. And I've seen that in so many bands. Some bands, they are aware that these speakers are for the for the people attending to the to the gig, and they only have monitors on stage. But in many of the small stages, they might have a monitor or two, and that's it. And for the bands that are used to rehearse in a rehearsal room with a decent PA down there for that room, they want to get that feel of loudness, and then they they tend to put the speakers on stage. But what happens here? No more distance, and no more their directivity. And that's where why a lot of those small gigs tend to have a lot of feedback. How can it be improved? Of course, directivity is very important. Hence, you see that Shure was one of the major contributors in the history of microphones, that they started with a microphone that was directional for the first time. And hence, they came with that nice slogan that was saying goodbye feedback. So. Microphone histor microphones historically were, were omnidirectional. So that means it doesn't have any directivity. So wherever you place the speakers, there's a tendency for the microphone to pick up the sound. So the first directional microphone as a cardioid microphone, which was the, the Super 55, that was solution to feedback because now the microphone can be directed away from the speakers. So that's a directional component. Of course, there is something called equalization and feedback reducers. And that's where a lot of the sound check is going on. So when bands do sound check, the sound engineer makes sure that the mics are properly EQ'd according to the venue. So to give an example of how venues can contribute in changing the tonality, that you walk sometimes into the washroom and your phone rings, it's either your boss or your wife or your mother. And you pick up the call because you know it's urgent and you start talking. But you know, the bathroom have this echoey sound, the boom in the room. It's so bad that changes the whole sound of, of yourself into the phone and makes the person on the other side even identify that. It's like, hey, are you in the bathroom? It's like, yeah, 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 this is important. It's like, hey man, finish your business, call me back. It's fine, I cannot hear you, done. So the venue itself, Regardless, I mean, of course, nobody's going to perform in a bathroom unless you're singing while having a shower. But if you are in a closed venue, in a, in a, in a uh, restaurant, in a bar, usually these are closed door venues and they resonate at certain frequencies. So what happens, they start to build up a color on top of the microphone. So equalization here starts to become more important. So you need to kind of correct that curve. So let's assume, again, the bathroom example. If you start ping, pinpointing these frequencies that are built up because of the reflections and you're reducing it down, your voice starts to be flat again. 
Now, some of the modern phones, they have two microphones, one closer to your mouth and one is at the back of the microphone, right on the top, in which it does a comparison between both of them, abstracts the common sounds and keeps your voice. So it kind of helps a little bit, but still, because the bathroom is so closed and small, the amount of echo and your voice leaking to the other microphone is quite a lot. So there's nothing much that phone can filter anymore. Now, there is an, another factor here, which is a slightly more scientific here, but it starts to make more sense, especially when you know what that factor is, which is on the top of this slide, and it's called PAG-NAG. PAG stands for the potential acoustic gain, and the NAG stands for the needed acoustic gain. Now, what is the difference between the potential acoustic gain and the needed acoustic gain? Now, imagine you're sitting in, in the living room and you wanna call your wife for a cup of tea. And then you reach out to the floor and bring up a megaphone and you start yelling through that megaphone and calling your wife, my lovely wife, would you please get me a cup of tea? How does that sound? It is an overkill, right? It only happens in the movies. But in, in logic here, does that small room require a megaphone? No. Why? Because naturally, if you say it even with your comfort while sitting on the couch, half asleep, I say, my lovely wife, would you please honor me with a cup of tea? He will still hear you. So that means the needed, needed acoustic gain for your wife to hear you from that distance few meters or a few feet away is that much. And when we say needed, needed for intelligibility. That means for her to understand what you're talking. Now, once you step outside of the living room into another room, subconsciously you start to yell because you know that if you just talk at your comfort zone, she's not gonna hear you. So now you start to increase your level or your projection level, so she can hear you. So your what you say is intelligible to her. So in venues in generally, the needed acoustic gain for the audience to hear everything to clarity at the farthest end of the venue is called the, the nag or the needed acoustic gain. Now, let's go back again to the same example that we started with, which is the megaphone in the living room. Now, have you ever heard somebody watching the news with two megaphones attached to a, to a PC or to a TV? No, I said PC because a lot of people are watching YouTube right now. But same thing, watching anything with two megaphones attached to them. Is that logical? No. Why? Because the potential acoustic gain in that room has a limitation as well, which the megaphone is already an overkill for that. But if somebody's using a megaphone in a nice open park, so for the people who are standing far away from the speaker, it sounds convenient because now they can hear them clearly. So that means the potential acoustic gain and the needed acoustic gain, they go hand in hand in which nothing should overlap on each other. And of course, the needed acoustic gain should not be more than the potential acoustic gain in that case. Otherwise, you're, you're putting way too much in the room. So in a live system, usually what we do is that we do a very simple calculation here, which is that we put these aspects into a formula, and then those together can give us a ratio that we can, or a factor that we can work with. Now, simply on Sure website, there is a nice formula there that you can use, and it's called the PAGNAG calculator. So if you go on Google and you type PAGNAG calculator or Sure PAGNAG calculator, there you have all the uh, variations, which is related to the closest person to the stage, the farthest person to the stage, the farthest person distance to the speaker, and the closest 
speaker to the microphone and then it can calculate that in which it will tell you if it's adequate for the room or not adequate for the room, which will mean it will increase potential for feedback. Now, until this moment, we haven't got the gain in terminology yet, but now it's paving the road for us. But before we get to that point, I just wanna cover a point about speakers. We, also, we did actually cover a little bit about speakers when you talked about SPL, sound pressure level, but the, uh, the nature of speakers also is following the nature of its sound. So generally, low frequencies are omnidirectional. Low frequencies tend to do more excursion to the speaker, so the speaker can actually move freely to generate low frequency. But mids and highs tend to have less excursion that means less movement. So generally, for the to produce a high power mid-range or high power tweeter, it becomes a bit more challenging. So most of these speakers will be, have the coil submerged in a kind of oil to keep it cool. And the other thing is, they try to reduce the power required to drive those speakers because they don't wanna overheat the coils to generate the sound based on power amplifiers pumping power into them. So they use something called waveguides. And the most basic waveguide that we use can be the megaphone, or it can be pretty much when you shout to somebody and you say this, megaphone, or you shout to somebody and yelling with cone around your, your mouth. So this is a simple waveguide. So what means when I do this is I'm actually starting to direct the sound and focus it more. But that means I'm also making the sound traveling in that distance more efficient. So most of the speakers, as you can see, for example, in this uh, slide here, would have at least a tweeter with a, uh, with a horn. They call them horn tweeters. Usually they focus on the mids or the high mids and the, and the treble frequencies. But low frequencies usually are omnidirectional. That means they travel anywhere. And the same example you have in some of your living rooms, people who have uh, home theaters. Uh, have you ever considered where you need to put the subwoofer? In most of the user manuals, you find that the subwoofer can be in any corner of the room because the bass sound can be anywhere. It doesn't have a directional, there's, doesn't have directivity. Of course, in, in major PA systems, like in big stages, there are techniques to create a directional low frequency drivers by doing you know, a delay stack behind them, or some manufacturers right now, they do cardioid subwoofers. But that is an extra mile in technology. But in a normal day, low frequencies are always omnidirectional. So that means, going back to directivity, to have microphone stepped away from the low frequencies, I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to do that. And the only way to do that is by simply high passing your vocal microphones because anyway our voices doesn't go as low as the kick sound or the bass guitar sound so we don't need our microphones to be sensitive in that point so using high pass filters is very important with vocal microphones to eliminate low frequency feedback because it's non-directional high frequencies on the other hand are very directional but that's also one of the main reasons when somebody walks in front of the pa down to the crowd on his own without consulting the stage manager. The first thing that happens is that the high frequency piercing sound, it's because of the tweeters right away directing into the microphone and causing the high frequency feedback. And this is usually the first thing that happens in, in a closed space or in a small space. Now, also, there's something related to speakers which is called the near field and the far field. And this is something also we, we talked about last time, which is related to the way the speakers are designed. So usually live PA speakers, they are far field. They have a long throw capability or they have a high SPL level per meter. That means when you read about the sensitivity of those speakers, it'll be saying, for example, 135 dB SPL at one kilohertz with a one meter distance. So a one meter distance microphone from the speaker with a one watt, one kilohertz tone injected into it, the microphone will be reading 
above 110 decibels. So this makes this speaker a, let's say, a far field. Some midfields usually are around the 110 down to 100. Near fields are below 100 usually. Most studio monitors would be around the, 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 the low figure, which is below 100 decibels. And that makes them safe to be used as studio monitors in that case. Otherwise, if you go for mid-size studio monitors, the, the ones that you see on the internet, and they're usually, let's say, not really cheap or not affordable, uh, those are actually midfield, and they mostly design these uh, monitors for uh, for your uh, uh, the artists who want to hear the mixes in the studio. So when somebody visits the producer in the studio and they want to hear the mix, they there is no room to sit behind the mixer because the mixer is that much; it only fits the engineer. So while they're sitting on the couch, the engineer then can fire up the the midfield or the far field, depends on the size of the studio. And then, <coughs> sorry, and then the uh, artist can hear the mix. Now, moving forward from all of this right now, that part of the presentation is over, so I'm gonna stop sharing the screen, and I'll be back with my video. Now let's talk more about gain and how is that relevant and how, how is that very controversial. Uh, in many places where I do trainings for the first time and when I have a lot of the, um, let's say, uh, new engineers or let's say amateur engineers and some of the musicians who want to do audio, the first question I ask them is if they know the difference between the small knob on the top on any mixer and the fader and the master fader. And I don't ask them to challenge them, of course, but I'd like to ask that question because that gives you an idea of their understanding of gain structure. Because this is one of the main things that people always do not do right. And the other reason why they don't do it right is because of failures, which they don't have any answers to it. I'm 100% sure that between all of the audience that we have today, at least few would tell us a story about a speaker that burnt or a speaker that failed in the middle of the show or an amplifier that stopped working in the middle of the show. And when you take it to the technician or you know the, 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 for the service engineer to have a look at it, the first thing they would ask you, did you, did you, did you overuse it? Did you, did you push it too much? And then after that gig, you start thinking about how much can you put into those speakers and where is the safe operation level for those speakers. Now, one ground rule that a lot of people need to know is that underpowering speakers is wrong. Overpowering speakers is the right way to do it. And that was a shocking piece of information even for myself. So an example is if I have a 100 watt speaker which amplifier should I use? Should I use a 100 watts amplifier or should I use a 200 watts amplifier? If you say it's a 100 watts amplifier, that means it's wrong. The right answer is you need to use a 200 watts amplifier. You need to overpower the speaker to keep the, the speaker safe from overheating. Because the little that I knew actually in the past is that what overheats the coil in the speaker and makes it break down is actually underpowering the speaker and sending in a saturated signal while the speaker's unable to do the full movement of it. And that ends up overheating the coil because you started to put in a square wave signal into the coils, and then the speaker fails, and the amplifier, of course, fails because the speaker got shorted, and then you lose the speaker and the amplifier. So the rule to, to power the speakers is using something called the music power. So most of the speakers, the PA speakers, they will have on the spec sheet the RMS power, and the music power. The music power is what you need to put your amplifiers at and not your RMS. Now, stepping away from this, we'll go back to this subject sometime later, going back again to the gain. The gain is the first thing that dictates what the microphone is going to be able to pick up. In another word, you can say it dictates your sensitivity of your audio chain. 
So increasing gain increases the sensitivity. Reducing gain reduces the sensitivity. Does that impact volume? Yes. Is it a volume knob? No. And this is where things start to go wrong. If you increase the gain, obviously, you're making the microphone pick up more sound, which results in more volume. But that is a kind of a fake volume, because if, if you're isolating the two uh, environments, if you're isolating the microphone from the speakers, it feels like you increase the volume. But to give you a more indication about how it is different from volume is that it increases also the ability of the microphone to pick up background sound versus pushing the actual volume. So gain results directly in more sensitivity. That means also, if you want to go a bit under the surface, it means the number of times the amplifier is going to amplify the signal. So it is a factor. So when I say 25, that means the signal out of the microphone is going to be amplified 25 times. If I say it is a factor of 50, that means it's 50 times. Or it can be in a factor of decibels. So the signal out of the microphone is going to be lifted up by that much decibels. So depends on the on the scale on your on your mixer or your preamp, you can actually get that to let's say to make it more more sensible to you. But most of the mixers they use decibels, and usually it's a dBv, so it's a voltage decibels by voltage and not dBsPl. Now let's go back again to the example that people always play. A fail safe with it. I'm going to do a small example here in my room. I have a pair of studio monitors in front of me here. I'm sorry you cannot see them because the camera is watching me. But I'm seeing the speakers. They need to see them through my actions. Now, the point here is what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to set up the gain for the microphone using the fail safe idea that a lot of people do, which means your mixer output is not maximized and your input is not maximized. And that way, you're not going to reach the maximum power of the system. So that means you're not going to burn the speaker or the amplifier. Fair? Let's do that. So I'm going to share with you my screen here, which is going to show the, the mixing desk or the remote of my mixing desk. So now, if I'm looking left, I'm looking at my mixer screen. So bear with me. The camera is here. Uh, so here you can see I have faders on my mixer, and these faders represent my input. Okay, so a very uh, simple example here: the microphone I'm using right now here has a volume to my speakers. Let me just unmute my speakers and do a simple example of feedback. So for those who don't know what feedback is, now they will hear it. So now I'm increasing my sound. Check. Check. So you can see that the pinging of the high frequency happened first. The high pitch ping is the first thing that happens. And the simple reason is this is the microphone, and right behind it directly is the horn that drives the high frequency drivers. So it's very directional. And any object in the room, including myself here, is an object that can reflect back the sound to the microphone because the distance between me and the speakers is very, very short. It's barely one meter. So that is a kind of example of when you have horn-loaded speakers, the first thing that would feed back is the high frequency. Now let's go back again to set up a microphone. So what I'm going to do, the famous SM58 colored new A flag. I keep saying that, right? I love this microphone. So. This mic right now is not set up at all. So I'm going to go on the channel here. I'm going to put my gain back to where it is. My fader is on zero, so I'll, I'll change that right now. So if it, anything is on zero, that means it's max. So on your mixers, zero means the maximum output on your mixer. Plus zero, it's the extra maximum output that you're your mixer is going to do. That means it's even amplification. Okay. So when it's on zero, that means it's the max. 
So also here, which is my master fader, this is also on zero. So that means it's the max, okay? I'm not talking to the mic yet. So still, this is my microphone. So uh, to set up a microphone, usually, this is gonna be down. And of course, your master fader is gonna be completely down. But what I'm gonna do, I don't wanna burn my speakers, right? So if zero is max, so that means my speakers are, let's say 500 watts per channel. So I don't wanna make the speaker put out the 500 watts. Let me put it down, you know, half the way, just below the 10. You know, half is always safe. So that means now I'm not gonna make the speaker go to the maximum anymore. And the same thing I wanna do with my microphone, I'm animating my channel. I wanna put my microphone just half the way through. So let's let's keep it safe, right? So check, 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 still no sound. And the reason is still the amplifier is not adding any amplification on the on the signal from the microphone. So for the for the amplifier or the preamplifier of your mixer, be able to build up a kind of momentum for the sound to be picked up. That means it needs to add sensitivity or start to add rounds of amplification, right? So what we'll do now, I'll start increasing the gain. So I'll push it up to zero, check one, two. Do you hear me? Maybe a little faint. Of course, you're gonna hear me from, from that microphone. But now if I mute this microphone, which is on channel three here, Two, one, two, check, one, two. Probably now you can hear me clearly. But you know what? Uh, I still cannot hear myself in the speaker. You know, I'm playing it safe. Let me increase the gain until I hear myself in the speakers. Check, hey, hey. Oh, now I can hear myself in the speakers with 49 decibels of gain. So, sounds good. Yeah, I think it sounds pretty loud to you as well on your side. Now, look what happens in the middle of the gig. So in the middle of the gig, when or when the gig starts actually, when all the musicians kick on stage and they start playing, and the vocalists go on stage, and the first thing you notice is like he's screaming his guts. Ah, well, you cannot hear anything. All you can hear is the guitars, the drums, the bass, the keyboards, and everything else. So what the people start to do, they start pushing the fader. More vocals. Yeah, can I have more vocals? Yes, let's go, more vocals. Okay, now we have more vocals here. Okay, now it sounds loud, but you know what? Still the whole band doesn't sound loud enough for me because now we have crowds in the venue and they're, they're talking, right? So what I do here, I start increasing my output, check, see what's going on. So anytime I start talking, there is a boom associated with the sound. So what needs here to be done is something else. And this is where the biggest mistake that people do when they don't understand what is the right gain structure for microphones. So the right way to do it, and I'll reset the channel again. I'll unmute this microphone so you can hear me. The right way to do it is to start from the right parameters of your PA system. Now, to complete the misery out of the previous setup that I did here, when you give less signals to your speakers, you're forcing also a distorted signal, which we call it the squared wave signal, which means if I'm trying to push a, a vibration, you know, vibration is smooth. If I try to push this vibration through a bottleneck, what happens to the top? It hits the top and the bottom. And what happens, it gets top. And that chopping of the nice wavy shape, which we always like to get to, becomes edgy. And these edges, because of the chopping, starts to look like a square. And we call it a square wave. But if that happens more compressed and more condensed, that ceiling starts to link with each other and it looks like a direct signal or DC signal, which directly starts to heat up the coils of the speakers. Even if you don't reach the maximum capability of your amplifiers. So pushing in a distorted signal into your PA system 
also causes the amplifier to overheat your speakers. So what happens here in a setup like this, also you end up burning speakers and amplifiers. Speakers burning, shorts the circuit, causes amplifiers to fail. Some amplifiers have protection, but sometimes the protection is not fast enough to engage in which it can disengage the amplifier or disengage the power of the amplifier. So what happens is the amplifier also end up burning. And usually amplifier burns are quite severe. They end up actually literally burning the PCB of the circuit because there's a lot of power there. Most of the big power amplifiers, they operate at 120, 160 volts DC inside the, the, the unit. So even if my amplifier is plugged into the wall 240 or 110 in the countries that is operating on 110, there is a transformer inside that changes the power supply into what is adequate for the amplifiers. Most of the big amplifiers that operate on 160 volts nominal. Some of them are even up to 180. Some of them do 200 and some of them do 80 maximum. So most of these small amplifiers for hi-fi systems, they operate between 50 and 90 volts, but all major PA systems, they operate on above that. And imagine that amount of voltage is getting shorted. So what happens is that the circuit is unable to hold the heat building up in a such a small moment. It ends up blowing. So going back again, what is the right operation conditions for a PA? The right operation conditions for a PA is to let you breathe freely. Imagine if you try to run 10 laps and then somebody holds your mouth with a little bit of leaking so you can breathe. You can't breathe. Even if you are breathing a little bit, you feel it's going to explode. You need to breathe freely. So the PA needs to breathe freely. So the first thing you need to do is make sure your PA is at the maximum capability where it can breathe. You can put limiters before that in which it actually shapes the signal without chopping. So soft limiters in the processors that are with the PA systems, it makes sure to limit the signal without changing the shape of it. And that is a safe way. So using, using usually uh, uh, PA system processors, so usually we have a person, we call him the system guy who does the alignment and all of the rigging and all the setting that is related to the big PA system in which the engineer just takes that out of his head. Some engineers like to double check that because in some places it's not done properly and unfortunately it's, it's a fact. But generally in an ideal situation, if you know there's a system guy running the PA, you're all cool. Now, when that is done, then you need to make sure that your PA, when you're starting your point at, your master fader is put on the max, zero. And before you start adding gain to your microphone, you put your channel fader, which is this one in my condition here, on zero. Now, even in this situation, if I talk in the microphone, hey, hey, check one, two, you're not hearing anything. I'll do another test using this mic so it'll be more right. You barely heard anything, right? So now what I need to do, just like we did before, now we start adding gain. But please try to pay attention to how much gain is needful in this case. For me to hear the speakers and say, now I can hear myself. I know for you on the, on the webinar, you actually heard me earlier before because it's going through the webinar. But in a normal situation, if you're listening to the speakers, it's a different ball game. So let's do that. So now I'm gonna start gaining this up. Check one, two, check one, two, check, hey, hey, one, two, hey, hey. Wow. At 26, I'm able to hear myself as loud as I did before when, when I went up to the 46 or even 49. Check one, two. This one is mute right now. This one is still clear. Now, even if I power up my master up, it's still stable because the way my microphone is operating right now is in sensitive condition. And you can see that I need less gain on my input to drive the microphone. And now I know when is it enough for me. And that's when we talk about the right gain structure. So when I, when I have my PA breathing freely, in which uh, the, it can actually produce the amount of headroom enough for me in a venue, and I can then assess how much is enough for me. 
what I do if I start with the vocals and I have my vocals singing a song, and please, that is something else which I need to add. Don't let your vocalist go on stage and check his mic by saying, hey, 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 you want to, hey, can I have more monitors? Hey, hey, you want to, want to. And when he goes sing, he goes, ah, what happens? Right away, you're going to have issues. You're either going to cause the whole band not to do anything, or the whole setting is not right. So when whenever I deal with, with singers, the first thing I tell them, if you start going like, check, check, more monitors, like, hey, can you sing me a part of your song? Because this is where I know he's going to perform his vocals, his instrument, as a musical instrument and not as a how to call the, 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 the gardener to, to water the, the plants, you know? Because this is a different ball game. I can get my instrument to play percussions on it, but if, I, if my instrument is a guitar, the moment I play the strings and I strum them, this is where it sounds like a guitar. But if I play it just to tap on it, hey, one, two, one, two, check, hey, 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 one, two. No, this is not the way to do it. So when I gauge that and he sings a part of the song and I know that the limit I'm getting with that much gain is right, trust me, this is the perfect situation. There is no, there is no feedback in that case. The only time when feedback starts to happen is that when you sound check instruments before the vocalist and you need to match the musicians with the vocalist in a situation where maybe there's not enough room for it. So the other way around is safer. Start with the vocalist, you know where you're a limit, and then you build up the band just around that, depends on the genre. Some genres slightly backed up, and some genres around it, or maybe slightly, you kind of keep the vocalist slightly in the middle. So most of the Western pop rock, you find the vocals kind of sitting between the mix. In some genres, you f like Middle Eastern music, you find that the vocalist is in front of the mix, right in the face. So based on that, then you know how much room you need. Now, that gain here is the first level of your gain structure. Do we have more? Yes, we said. A building has a structure, it has a basement, and then it has another parts of it. Where does that come? It comes. First of all, you have an equalizer. Does my sound sound good to you right now? Of course it does. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting in a room. It's pretty dead. It's a studio. So to some extent, it's okay. But I have my speakers in front of me here. And there's a little bit of a ping. Can I get rid of it? Yes. Which ping is it? It's around that one here. Check. Hey, 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 hey. You can hear that. This is a typical example of being used in the bathroom when the room resonates a little bit at certain frequencies and builds them up. So the room is contributing and adding natural acoustic gain to certain frequencies of it, uh, above the others. Now, why equalization is helpful as a second degree in addition to directivity and distance is that I can reduce what the room can do. So this one is gaining in the room. Now I can reduce it here. And now it gives me more gain before feedback. And that was the terminology we heard before, is that now it gives me more ability to push my level on my fader, which is here. I know it's wrong to go above zero, and I'll speak about that. But now I can go here, and it's still operating to some extent, to some extent. Hey, but you can see there's another ping happening right now. And the reason why, because now I went to the third level of gain structure, which is my actual fader. But it only happens when you cross your zeros. Simply, why? If I keep it on zero here and my master also on zero, what happens is that, am I adding any amplification here? Let's calculate it. Zeros times zeros is equal to zero. So no, there is no amplification. So now it's literally passing through. So when does it start to add amplification? When we cross the zero. And because system works in, in logarithms or its algorithm, so it's, it's not linear, it's nonlinear, it's gonna be different. So what happens? Let's assume I go plus five here, and I plus five here. Five times five is 25. And you can see now, this is why there is tendency to have feedback. 
So that was the third game structure, but it's split into two. You have your channel fader and you have your master fader, which also adds a level of game structure. But some engineers, by mistake, they like to color the sound. So let's say my sound is muddy and I speak like this. Hey, how are you? What are you doing? So there is no, there is no definition, right? How can I add definition to a guy who speaks, hey, what's going on? You need to add treble. So some people just do this. Hey, what you doing? It's a bit clearer, right? But you're going to hear now there is a ping. So your EQ is adding gain on certain frequencies. Now it's sounding nasal. And now just by turning that down again, it stabilizes again. So the way you EQ as well adds another gain structure on your chain. So that's why subtractive EQ is very important in that case. Take off what you don't want and don't boost what is not there. So back to that dude who speaks, hey you, hey, hey, what's going on? A lot of bass? Hey, hey, what's going on? See, now it's cleared up. Or just high pass filter. So as we said before, because low frequencies are omnidirectional, so now if I just increase my high pass filter, where this one is, done. Hey, hey, what's going on? Still, I can mimic that, right? So eliminating how much you don't want is important. Think always, what is that that is annoying me? Find it, remove it. This way you keep your gain structure stabilizes. And don't keep it in a safe way. It's like, what if he plays softer? It's like, don't ask him to play consistent. A lot of these musicians, when they sound check, they play soft, especially the percussionists. And when you have seven or eight or 12 of them, especially in the, the uh, Belize music and the Gulf music, usually have minimum seven, you can go, go up to 12. And in every sound check, you ask him to play, he starts playing normally. And they start asking for a lot of monitoring. And during the show, all the inputs are peaked on red. So what you need to tell them is like, play with the maximum you're gonna play. Give me your max. Now you know where he's gonna go. And that's where you benchmark what's gonna happen. And then you force him to play consistently in all of the gigs. But if he, it's the same way the, the vocals, the vocalists try to do a sound check with the, you know, a small uh, word here or there. So this kind of shows the total gain structure for most of this, the, the systems that you would deal with in terms of audio. Now, there's one last thing he's going to talk about, which is the number of microphones in the same space. When you increase the number of microphones in the same space. So I have a microphone here next to me. It has a switch on and off. Now, what happens when I have another microphone, I set it up backing vocals or two backing vocals next to each other with two separate mics. The moment you open the microphone, wow, that's a lot. Let me decrease that and let me decrease mine as well. Let me see. Check one, two, check one, two, check one, two. Already the sound is not stable. So the added microphones on stage increases the gain because you're increasing the surface. So increasing the surface increases the acoustic gain sensitivity in the room naturally, just like how the room contributes in adding certain frequency. The more microphones in the room adds more sensitivity to the whole system. So that means when I have more microphones, I need to consider that and reduce the gain a notch. So I go into my channel, this is 34, that is a lot. I go down to, let's say, 25 dB. Let's go back to mine here, 26. Okay, that's fine. And now when I open my channel here, check one, two, check one, two, check one, two. It's a pretty steady run here. So this kind of concludes my testing here, but I'd like to bring some more tests from the field. And the test from the field, always more interesting when you do it with somebody from the field. So uh, 
my good friend and colleague, Fali from uh, India, a very known uh, front of house engineer. Uh, actually, a lot of people look up to him on how do you do this? How do you do your magic to make the sound sound good? But you know, it's not magic as long as you know how you dissect that into small portions. So, uh, Fali, would you uh, yep. step in and talk about your part? Absolutely. Um, so, yeah. Um, when we get the first thing I will do when, uh, even before the musicians and everyone arrives, is I will have a vocalist lead vocal microphone with me at front of house. The reason for that is I want to check how much gain I can add onto that mic in a normal talking voice, kind of in a softer singing voice, and kind of in a louder voice. I just want to make sure that I have enough gain before feedback. Now you would say, why would I do that in front of the PA from the console? The reason for that is in most of our shows, we have this 60 or an 80 foot ramp that juts out from the center of the stage, which means typically the artist is in front of the PA system. Um, so if I get enough gain without any feedback at the console, uh, that almost guarantees that when the singer is on the ramp uh, in the front of the stage that you know, I'm not going to get any feedback from his microphone in front of the PA system. And once I've done that, it basically everything else in the band, all other instruments, all other microphones, DIs, uh, whatever it may be, uh, get balanced in respect to that lead vocal microphone. So very often, say even if I'm doing like a drum check, um, I always have in the back of my mind what that uh, microphone volume was when I set it, gain-wise. Um, also very important to remember, like Barry mentioned, first thing is fader up at zero. And then you start bringing up the gain until you have enough gain before feedback. Uh, and not the other way around where you have the fader somewhere uh, midway and then you start turning up the gain uh, uh, you're basically think of think of gain as this bucket, and um, um, uh, there's a bucket, and your hand is actually the gain knob. If you have little gain, you can only pick up something that's at the top of the bucket. As and as you have more gain, you can reach into the bucket and pull stuff out. So you're basically not only amplifying uh, that one microphone, you're also amplifying um, the uh, pickup of noise and stuff around the microphone. Uh, that's the thing that a lot of people fall into a trap. Um, and the simplest way to do that, to not fall in that trap, is firstly have your fader up at zero. Whatever you're checking, it can be a kick drum, it can be a, a tabla, a sitar, any kind of instrument. Fader up at zero, now start bringing up your gain. But you always have to bring that gain up in relation to something. And for me, that relation is that lead vocal microphone that I've checked right before at the start of my sound check. So once everything is brought up to in relation to that microphone, I can pretty much you know, guarantee that once the band starts playing, uh, all I might need to do at the most is maybe just pull down uh, my band, like a band VCA. I just pull it down like a dB, dB and a half, maybe two dB, just to make a little room for the vocal. But beyond that, everything just falls into place. Um, now, when it comes to tricky subjects like, um, um, you know, getting the musician to give you the right level so that you can set the right gain, that just like Barry said is very crucial. So you can't have someone. Uh, you know, coming close to a mic and saying, check, 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 yeah, can I have more monitor? And then once they're ready to start singing, they go, check, 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 and now it's too loud. So that kind of control also needs to come from the engineer when they are interacting with the with the musicians. So my basic thing for most of them is I want to hear show levels. So I want to hear show levels from a guitar, show levels from a bass, show levels from vocal. And I do not want to hear any random parts. I want to hear this so-and-so part from so-and-so song. So I want them to play parts from the songs that they're going to play. 
rather than play something completely different because that again uh, changes my perception of what is actually going to happen in the song so it's just these couple of things that that helps sort out these gain structure kind of um, kind of uh, issues rest of them i think uh, barry covered like really really well i mean um, it's something that you get into with a little practice and then once you get a hang of it you don't ever go back to doing it any other any other way yeah um as far as you know having these multiple microphones like i'll give you a I'll give you guys a small example uh, when I do shows for uh, uh, Mr. Rehman in India, we have about 16 cordless microphones open simultaneously on stage. Uh, now, you know, if you've not set your gain structure correctly, that can be a big, big problem. Um, and it, it goes, um, you know, this little discipline as far as setting gain structure, like Barry mentioned, like I'm mentioning, is very, very very critical, very crucial. Um, you know, there are times that we have even, you know, some of them, eight or nine of them down a ramp in front of the PA system. Now, how do you make sure that you can still hear them without having that PA system feedback? Now, that's also has to, a lot of that has to do with gain structure. Well, that is very informative. Um, one small question. I've heard about things people talk about, which is mostly happening in uh, conferences over performances, but there's something that they talk about the most of the time, it's the auto mixers. I was surprised yeah. that even in some TV stations when they don't have, uh, they cannot, like the small TV stations where they cannot afford having an engineer all the time, they'd like to buy some of those rack units that has an auto mixer on board and just have yeah. you know their uh, their panel connected to it. Can you can you just tell us about those auto mixers? I mean, how how do they work? Well, what what's what's under the hood? Yeah, I mean there are uh, Shaw has its um, auto mixer, which is the Intellimix. There are others that make these hardware based um, auto mix solutions, and basically the idea behind them is if you have say sixteen uh presenters in a room that all need to present together you can't possibly have a sound engineer there ready to listen to who's starting to talk and then push his mic up and pull everyone down so that whole function has been automated through software and in some cases through hardware whereby the device intelligently knows you know who's talking and the great thing about that is it does not increase the volume of who's talking. It actually pulls the volume of everyone else down. Um, that's how they typically work. So you can go into large conferences. Um, and I believe like you can do, at least from some of the stuff that I'd worked on, you can do up to 34. Some of them let you do up to 64 inputs. So you can have 64 people uh, connected to like a lapel on stage doing a panel discussion. And the software will intelligently, you know, push up, uh, pull down who's not talking and leave the person that's talking at the same uh, at the same volume. Now, the catch with that is that you still need to set that gain before the software takes over and starts doing its thing. So that gain on that on each of those lavaliers to an extent needs to be set up by you. After that, the software takes over and does the intelligent uh, mixing of those by itself and it's a it's a game changer it's uh it's virtually impossible it's difficult enough to do eight simultaneously doing 16 and 24 and 32 is virtually uh it's not possible uh very true yeah that means there is no escape from the room work what you explained you still need to set up your channels and you need to still push yep. the gain where yep. you find it adequate yes that is good to know. yes good to yes know. i yep. think you're referring yep. to yep. your intellimix uh, uh, uh software right Yep. 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 Nice. Well, uh, thank you, Farley, for your uh, information. It was uh, very, uh, very informative. Uh, getting it from the field is always different. I have one question to you, uh, which is something related to uh, 
some people call it, you know, the feedback reducers, or uh, I think in some consoles it's like a dynamic EQ, some cases. Right. Uh, can you can you talk about those in in lights of also right. people want to get rid of doing any EQs versus the auto mix right. not doing any gain? So would right. this also right. kind of give me a relief from EQing any microphone? Yeah, you know, um, in fact, way back when I started working, there used to be a sure uh, feedback suppressor, like many, many years ago, and we used to use that off and on. But but the thing is, if you've set up your gains correctly, if you've set up the PA correctly, if it's in the PA is in the correct position, if you're using enough speakers to cover a venue where you're not over amplifying the speaker system. You don't really need any of these other tools. Um, you could, like you know, go with like a a dynamic EQ specifically in the HF, you know, in the high region. Once you figured out what feedback or what frequency is feeding back, you could do that. But it's those are only in situations where everything else has not been done correctly. So if you have the PA in the right place, if you have the right amount of PA. If you're using the right kind of microphones, um, um, you generally will not get into these feedback. And if you set up your gains correctly, you generally will not get into these feedback kind of uh, kind of situations. Um, I personally don't remember when was the last time uh, getting feedback kind of a thing. It's it's once it's done properly, you should never have a problem. Yes, that's very true. Of course, uh, there there are other tools that maybe I can. Uh... I like them is that using using the right monitoring on stage. Uh, I know Fally is a firm believer of in-ear monitors, and myself as well. I mean, I, I I'd love if every band can start to consider using in-ear monitors because this is one of the very useful ways to cut that loop of feedback. You know, speaker being close enough to a microphone, because right. the moment you start using in-ears, you just you, you chop that. It's impossible. You, your 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 in ears are going to leak out to the microphone by any chance, so this gives you a lot of potential to increase the gain of your microphone, because the the possibility for the main PA to leak back to your microphone on a on a medium stage, it's very hard. So the moment you get rid of that wedge, this is where things start to be more stable on stage, and then you get, you know, the ability to combat a lot of these issues. Uh, thank you, Fali, very much. Uh, appreciate your uh, input today. Um, most most welcome and thank you for having me. Anytime. Uh, before closing today, we're gonna run a small poll, which is gonna be uh, about instruments. I know a lot of you guys attending today might be musicians as well, or at least engineers who are interested in musicians in, mus in, in certain music instruments. Uh, I mean, personally, my first passion was in drums, and then I found myself interested in guitars and in keyboards, and then just went through. But definitely, there, there's always that interesting instrument that you really like to know about how it's mic'd up. So uh, we're, we're going to run a poll right now, and uh, we would like your input to to kind of get some information from that poll, which is what is that instrument that you'd love us to demo on how to mic? Uh, the reason why we're doing this right now is that we are we are going to do a very interesting sessions down the line in the webinars, which will show you how we mic certain instruments. Luckily here in the studio, I have uh, the capability to do that. So uh, all I need to do is uh, get a certain instrument and uh, mic it up uh, and uh, you know take probably some photos and some videos and sound bites and let you hear that. And then we'll let you know about these different techniques. Of course, uh, having the, uh, having access to to steal some time from Fali as well is very important because Fali works closely with uh, big bands and uh, he also got a lot of experience in miking certain uh, instruments and one thing I'd like to assure you is like there is no one size fits all and I hate when some engineers tell you it's this way or it's not going to sound good or I oh, know you've not done it right because y your method is completely wrong if if you know the sound source properly and you, you can hear it properly without a microphone, then the next stage is where to put the microphone. There is no right and wrong, so that's why it's a collaborative effort between me and Fali to do it. Um, 
I think also we might be inviting certain guests. So we'll keep that as a surprise. So if we have a certain instrument that we're gonna mic up and we have an instrumentalist related to this, it's a very good idea to bring that person as a guest and get his opinion or his input on how these things sound like. So please guys feel free to, uh, to uh, pitch in the poll. And without further ado, right now we're gonna move into the Q&A. Thank you for those who typed in the questions. So for those who didn't know about it, there's a question uh, block down there uh, on your right. That's Q&A, just type in any question that comes up to your mind and we'll be more than happy to uh, answer them. So Fali, you wanna read the questions or do you want me to read them? Yep, sure. Uh, so we have a question here that says, when we are using an EQ, what is the difference between it being pre-fader or being post-fader? Lovely. This is a very good question, by the way. And the guy who uh, wrote this question is, uh, is a clever guy. And I know that this guy also suffered a lot in taking a decision on that matter. So the thing is, again, it's not one size fits all. And, and you know, if I tell you always do it pre-fader, I'll be wrong. And if I tell you always do it post-fader, that is also wrong. It depends on your instrument. Now, some instruments would have a very consistent, uh, consistent uh, S natural SPL on stage. Like when I clap, this is louder than my voice. It is loud. Naturally, it generates a high SPL, okay? So that means I, 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 I know that there is no effort that is gonna die in the room or there's no effort gonna build up. So what happens here, it's good to have it pre-fader, do your EQs, set your level, Done, it's over. But when do you need something to be post fader? In cases when you have a group channel, so you have, let's say you have a chorus, okay? Five, six, 12, 20 guys. And you wanna set an EQ for these people. It's good to group all of these people into one channel and EQ that. But that channel is gonna be stereo in that case because they're gonna have a stereo chorus. So in that case, it's a post EQ because you're, you're taking the whole mix of that certain group and you're EQing it. But to be honest, I cannot cover the situation and tell you which one is better. You need to be the judge in that case and you need to be the, to be the wise judge on when you are EQing, are you adding gain to that level or are you reducing? If your fader from that particular channel is on zero and you cannot have it less, that means it's better to have your EQ free to that because you don't wanna be either killing your headroom or affecting the the uh, the outcome or the added gain on top, which might result in feedback as well. One other thing is uh, that my colleague Fally referred to in many of his online uh, webinars as well, if you follow him, is that using excessive EQ kills your, it causes phasing. And phasing is when, when you have, you know, the, the summation of sounds is not, not linear anymore and it's becoming kind of non-linear. So some frequencies will delete each other and some frequencies will add on top of each other in a non-musical way. And this is something also you need to avoid because once that happens, it's not gonna help you. You start hearing whistling, swishing, uh, something flying on stage where it's nothing flying on stage. So all these sounds are, are, are gonna irritate your mix. So it's better not to play with your phase, post your fader. So your faders set everything done for you. You know what you're doing down there. It's better to keep it pre-fader. Uh, I don't know, Fali, would you, would you bring something from your experience in that case to answer that question as well? Yeah, you know what? That's a, that's a very, very good question. And it's, um, um, it, I think it entirely depends on the situation, like Barry said. For most general circumstances, you would go EQing pre-fader, or at least I would do that. But in a case like Barry mentioned, where you know you have the um, you know eight or ten choir singers, or you know eight or ten violins, etc., I would put all of those into a group, and then uh, EQ. I, I might just do like a global high pass and low pass on individual channels. But then if I wanted to shape the sound of the entire 
chorus or violin section, then I would do that from the from the group. Yeah, but good, um, good, good uh, question. And the thing is, it saves you a lot of time doing it post fader from a group as opposed to individually doing each, um, you know, tweaking each single channel. Because I think at the end, especially a large section is going to play together. They're not really going to be playing individually. If you have 16 violins, they'll all be playing as a violin section. So in that case, you can definitely go EQing uh, post fader. No problem at all. Thank you, Valley. As uh, I'll just add one more thing. As far as your your as far as the thing regarding phase, I think that's the most uh, neglected concept when it comes to EQing. And the thing is, the more you EQ, and especially if you have mics that are closer to each other, the more you start EQing, the more you start putting those mics out of phase. So think about it like even if you have like a pair of uh, congas and you have a mic on each conga, which might be about six inches apart. And now you start adding a decent amount of top end on one of them and you start cutting something on the other one. You are now starting to play with how those two mics interact with each other because both are quite close. They're both picking up, you know, partially one instrument and partially the other. So definitely uh, it should be controlling the EQ and you control the EQ by just making good mic choices and making good mic placement choices, these two things. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Pally. So that was a nice question. So what do we have another question here? Okay, so somebody's asking about the video. Uh, the video will get to you actually in your inbox, the same email that you registered. So this is where you get the uh, uh, the video, and it's the link to that is going to be on YouTube, so it's public. Uh, unless you're referring to something else. Um, we've got uh, two more questions, and one is, does the gain before feedback work differently on a condenser versus a dynamic mic, and a vocal versus a instrument microphone? That is a very, very good question. Uh, the answer to that in short words, yes, there is a difference. And the main difference is under the hood of any condenser microphone like this one, or maybe you know the famous SM81, inside this handle here, there is a preamp already. So that means the amount of output coming from the microphone here compared to a dynamic microphone is already higher. So that means the condenser microphones in terms of a circuitry, tends to give you more gain before feedback in certain situations, but not always. The reason why also because the diaphragm is actually sensitive. So you need to be considerate in terms of where is this microphone placed and in front of what. So let's say if, if I have a flute player, usually flute, flutes are not loud, no matter how much they can push through that. If you put them next to a keyboard or next to a violin or next to a cello, they will definitely outpower him acoustically. So you hear me always talking about the acoustic sound pressure level naturally, because this is where your judgment starts from. Uh, if you have a heavy drummer and you know he is like heavy handed, I would consider then lowering the gain for that because I know he's gonna hit hard enough. Why should I give him more gain? Why should I amplify the signal higher than I supposed to? And then also depends on the source as well. Is like, is this source having a lot of high frequency articulation on it? Do you, do you want the breath sound of the of the of the flute? Do you want it? Yes, no. Uh, is he not powering it enough? Then I'll decide also which which microphone I'll use with him. I can go with a dynamic microphone and I can go with a condenser, but it, it depends on the situation as well. I mean, uh, condensers tend to give you a, a very good gain before feedback in many situations, but in some situations as well they tend to pick up a lot of the surrounding sound that you don't want, which can contribute as well in more feedback. So it depends on your placement. I think, Fali, you do a lot of these blends in your in your uh, setup. You do you do uh, uh, use condensers and dynamics at the same time. Is that true? Yep, 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 yep. very, very, very true. Uh, and, it, and it just comes down to what we end up using where, honestly. Um, <clears throat> 
generally yes gain before feedback can be a little concerning with condenser mics but only if your source is very soft if you have a decently loud source and then you use a condenser on it not a big deal not a problem at all uh, so yeah it, it just i don't think it's it's microphone specific i think more often it's the uh, uh, what source you pair with what kind of microphone I think it's the combination of the two that determines how much gain before feedback you uh, will end up uh, end up getting. Yeah, but good um, good question, that one. Yep. Do you have any more questions? Right. We, yeah, we've got one more that says to avoid feedback. What do you think about EQing monitor returns instead of the live track? So EQing the returns of the monitors instead of the inputs. That, that is that is a very good comment here. I, I, I can call that a comment more than a question. Uh, and to to kind of confirm your comment, this is actually what we tend to do most of the times. Also within reason, for example, if I'm if I'm sending a monitor to a drummer and I know that you know the monitor is in a wash situation next to a throne and it might feed back on his kick. So if I if I kill the lows to eliminate the kick. He's going to ask me for more kick on his on his monitor. So, to be to be fair, it's it's a blend of choosing the right gain when you have monitors or when you don't, and and that is the main reason when we talked about in ear monitors, because what is you are always the judge between setting up the convenient gain to get the nicest headroom and the nicest sounding instrument. But then you know the, the, you have the hindrance of having a monitor on stage, and once you have a monitor on stage, it starts to limit everything. So you start doing the kick, and you're happy with it, and it's like nice, you know, punch to it and that body. And then now you need to send some of that to the drummer because most of the drummers would ask you for the kick primarily, and then something else could be the snare or it could be one of the toms. But most of the drummers definitely would ask for a kick. And then the moment you start pushing the kick. Through the the monitor, you start getting that you know uh, low frequency verb or that never ending kick, boom. So it, it was sounding good before, tight. I was not pushing so much gain, but the moment I started pushing the monitor for him, started getting feedback. So now now I started to remove certain frequencies from the kick, or certain frequencies from the monitor because I don't want to color the kick. I'm happy with the kick. But then the drummer starts to tell you, he's like, I'm not getting that, you know, I'm not feeling it. And then you go into that endless, you know, discussion on how can you make it, make him feel it while you don't have room to make him feel it. So the easiest thing is, is usually for vocalists because usually certain frequencies that feedback with a vocal mic can be reduced and you will not feel it because it's going to get some of the bleed from other monitors or from the main PA back on the stage just a bit. To complement the losses, but when it comes to instruments, this is where it becomes critical. And then, the ultimate solution to this in ears, one answer. And I'm 100% sure that Fally will answer you the right way to do it to EQ your monitors. Put in ears. Uh, absolutely, no question. You don't like. Uh, you definitely don't EQ um, a live track in order to avoid feedback. You just keep it as natural as possible. And then, if you need to. Firstly, if you need to avoid feedback, figure out what's going wrong to cause that feedback. Figure that out first. And then if you need to EQ, uh, it's a better practice to EQ the uh, monitor. But again, within within reason. Uh, because the moment you start EQing the monitor, now you've shaped the sound of the entire, of the entire monitor. Uh, and then you get into a circumstance where if you EQ the track, the problem that you'll start finding is you might EQ that track for the singer, so now it sounds fine for the singer, but maybe it starts to sound very dull for other musicians in the band. So you know now you're stuck. So the better option would be uh, first to get to figure out why that feedback is happening, and the second thing would be if needed, yes, EQ, but then go and EQ the monitor, and then preferably uh, choose uh, either a graphic equalizer. Or if you have access to like a linear phase equalizer like the Dolby Lake, uh, then you EQ off the Dolby Lake because those EQs you can uh, you can cut and they don't uh, alter your phase. Uh, so you'll very often find uh, 
pro monitor engineers they always even though the consoles have graphic equalizers they will almost never use that eq they will always go through a dolby lake and they will eq from the dolby lake um so yeah that's a that's a little insider tip to eqing monitors nice nice thank you pally so do we have no any problem. questions left no i believe that is is it um uh, guys to the to the right side of your screen there is a uh, there are some polls which are running live so um that will help us to and that will help Barry to in the next few sessions uh, to to discuss like decide what you guys require you can go ahead and and attend those polls nice nice well these are the topics for today i think the topic for today is very uh, debatable you will not find two engineers talking about a lot of things in their career more than the topic we we just talked about today the equalization uh, of course the the gain structure in general uh, we will have a specific uh, webinar talking about compression it of course it is one of the gain structures we didn't touch up upon this yet because it will complicate things way too much that the hour or hour and a half that we associated with this webinar will be enough for this so the just to give you a bit of a teaser here, compression is the way that you can reshape the sound from the start until the end in a very constructive way that would kind of make everything sit nicely in your mix. But there is a lot of technicalities related to this. And a lot of the engineers, unfortunately, they are afraid or they have no idea what exactly compression does. And the moment you speak about compression, they start thinking that this is a way to reduce my headroom. It is a double-edged dream, but also it's a way to make things sound better in your headroom and more naturally to the behavior of the instrument. So, uh, but again, why is it debatable? Because everything we talk about today, as you can hear, it has two scenarios. There's a scenario when you have this, but you know, when you have that, there's a scenario when you do this. So. If I was sitting between you today, I'll I'll be kind of confused, but I'm also I'll be kind of getting more ideas on where to start first. And the the more you ask questions, the more scenarios you know about. And this is where uh, networking with other engineers is very helpful. This is where you start getting different practices and start you shape the way you do things. Uh, so uh, again, I'd like to thank everybody for being here today, and. Whoever is joining us continuously as well, thank you very much. For those who contributed with questions and in the poll as well, I thank you very much. I'd like to thank my uh, colleague and uh, my moderator, uh, Bali, and my other moderator behind the scene, uh, Marwan. He's handling the marketing in the region here. So uh, thank you very much again for attending, and we're looking forward to see you in our next webinars on Thursday. Uh, until then, stay safe and we'll see you soon. Have a good one. Good night.